Kia ora, I'm Sharon Brett Kelly, and just a warning, today's detail has descriptions of violence. It is a Pacific country of more than 9 million people, sitting just north of Australia, immensely rich in resources, its community so remote and diverse, more than 800 languages are spoken there. We know so little about Papua New Guinea, except stories like this. More details are emerging about the horrific violence on Kiriwina Island in the remote Trobriand and archipelago of Papua New Guinea. Local leaders say tensions arose between two groups last month following the death of a man at a soccer game. There are many layers to the rivalry, including political in division. The, case of the killing of the 16 women and children in, in the Hela province. Some of the people are getting killed, shot up, uh, businesses are affected. But something else has been going on that involves torture, mutilation and burning people alive. The story occasionally hits headlines and then disappears, yet it is rife and growing. Sangoma has blanketed what to the outside world they might put it all in a bracket of like sorcery. Term Sangoma is foreign. It's not Melanesian, and certainly it is not Papua New Guinea. Today on The Detail, I talked to filmmaker Paul Wolfram about his film on sorcery killings in the Papua New Guinea highlands and his warning that New Zealand should sit up and take more notice. People are starting to talk about it verging on a failed state, and if that happens, it could have a huge impact on New Zealand. This is a clip from Wildfire, a 20-minute documentary Paul made before filming was disrupted by COVID. The narrator is saying that sorcery accusation violence is running wild in her country and it's taking many innocent lives, like Wildfire. Paul Wolfram has just gone back to Papua New Guinea to complete the film. So you, you're a filmmaker and you're associate professor in the film program at Te Heringa Waka. Uh, but what about your work in PNG? Because you've been over there doing work for about 20 years. Yeah, that's right. I um, first went over to Papua New Guinea doing some research for my PhD and I was focused on the music and dance and cultural practices of the people I was living with in a very different part of Papua New Guinea and in the island region of Papua New Guinea, a place called New Ireland. And I lived in the rainforest down there for about two years with a small community, learning how to sing and dance with the people there, really. In 2001, I left New Zealand and made my way to one of the most isolated and unique corners of the earth. And this was a great introduction to Papua New Guinea. Um, very welcoming communities. They hardly ever see outsiders, so a lovely, lovely hosts. Well, that sounds quite different to the communities that you've been to in the Papua New Guinea highlands, where this this fear of witches and sorcery is is rife. That's right. So more recently, I think it was 2017, I went up to volunteer some time uh, teaching film production at a um, the Garoka University up in the Highlands. And when I was up there, I was astounded by um, how different things are in the Highlands. In the Islands, I lived with a matrilineal society. That means that women um, pass down the clan through their clan names, you know, mm. and also that women hold the land. And it tends to be a more of a matrilocal practice where people, when they get married, they move to the land of the of the wife. And therefore she's surrounded by her brothers and father and uncles and all of those sort of support networks um, exist. The first time I went to the Highlands back in 2015, I think it was, um, I saw evidence immediately of the way that gender roles are, are very different in the Highlands. And unfortunately, it's, it's rife, the gender-based violence that's up there. So, so domestic violence. It's one part of it. I mean, we have other, you know, there's a huge population in the Highlands, lots more people living up there and lots more orientation towards seeing what's been taken out of their, their land, um, you know, mining, forestry being taken out of their land, and they can 
they can see helicopters flying over their heads all the time in the highlands, and yet you know um, nobody around them in their villages can afford you know cars even or mm. bicycles sometimes. How did you come across these cases of sorcery killings? Within the first week in Goroka, I was down at the markets and, you know, buying vegetables and people came up to me and I started chatting with them. And once they discovered I could talk fluently with them, people are fascinated with outsiders. You know, they want to know what secrets, you know, white people know about developing things. And um, and in those conversations, I was very quickly told about how those people and um, that I was, you know, talking to me were dealing with sorcery violence in their village. And one young man told me without any qualms or hesitation that they recently had to kill a witch in his village because um, if they didn't take care of it, nobody else would to stop what they perceive as sorcery in their communities. It's a new idea in Papua New Guinea too. I was going so, to say, is, is, it's not part of their custom. Well, I mean, they have this pre-existing belief in, in magical practices and a magical worldview. And in many places had traditional sorcerers. They weren't called um, what they are referred to now as Sanguma. And they were often seen as like Tohonga. They were traditional holders of knowledge. And people always understood in the Highlands that, well, this is, they believed that nobody ever died of old age. Everybody was eventually taken out by sorcery. But there was no physical enacting of that violence, or very little of it. People would sorcerize each other over the mountain and the next tribal group. And, and if somebody died, then they would send the black magic back over the mountain again. But now people are enacting violence on each other. Now, these days, if someone who is educated in his prime of life, and then suddenly he falls, he drops dead. Now, you and I will understand that this is something to do with lifestyle disease, this is something to do with things like that. But what about the one in the village? What do they know about lifestyle disease? The aftermath is, oh, someone is responsible. Now, who is responsible? What is a witch to them? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, anthropologically, the difference between witches and um, sorcerers, there there is some distinctions there. But when we talk about sorcery violence, we're talking about a belief that somebody else is eating the heart of the deceased, magically removing the heart and, and destroying that person. What tends to happen is that somebody dies perceived prematurely in the community and immediately people start to look around for who's to blame People are, are going, well, that, that old woman, she's a bit strange. Maybe she was a witch. And women and men have been accused of being witches? Yeah. And I should mention that this doesn't occur in all parts of Papua New Guinea. As, you know, the islands are relatively peaceful. I've never heard of any cases of Sanguma violence out there. But in the places that I'm working up in Garoka, Shimbu, uh, the Eastern Highlands and Western Highlands, these are places where women are targeted more than men. When you say they're identified and then tortured and killed and that there are shocking scenes of mob violence, what's it like? Well, I fortunately haven't been at the centre of any of those events, but I've seen videos that have been sent to me. And what I saw was you know, a group of about 30 young men surrounding a woman who was in a ditch and they'd tied her hands and legs and stripped her naked. She looked to be in her early 50s. And then they proceeded to to burn her with um, hot irons, um, pieces of number eight wire heated on the fire and then burn, burning her on the soles of her feet. Horrific scenes. What I noticed was that there's one or two older men that seemed to be directing what the young men were doing in front of them. And then towards the end of the video, I saw a um, the rest of the community, perhaps 200 people sitting down and watching the events take place. So what you have here is a, a ubiquitous belief in sorcery. This is not, you know, just happening in occasional strains. Um, you know, the belief in sorcery has completely dominated the people's mindsets up there at the moment. Are there drugs involved or alcohol? Well, in those particular instances where young men are kind of, they form the, if you like, the action group, the people that are actually the physical perpetrators, um, often uh, marijuana and um, alcohol are part of the picture. Um, think of the trauma that is in those perpetrators as well. You know, they, they have to live with killing people in their own, and those memories are going to be uh, inside them for a while, and it's it's just starting to really increase in frightening numbers 
especially in the last year coming out of COVID. You were saying that, you know, in the Highlands, people see the helicopters, they see the money that's being made from mining and they can't even afford a, a bike. Is that part of it? I mean, is there a lot of anger there? I think it's difficult to put your finger on one particular thing, but yes, there is a huge range of risk factors in Papua New Guinea. Those include climate change, natural disasters, economic inequality, tribal violence, gender violence. So there's all these things going on at the same time, and it arises from a a dissatisfaction and a mistrust of government. All of these factors combine to create instability in the nation, but there is... You know, for for me particularly, I remember being up in Shimbu last time I was up there in 2019, very remote area, um, and I, after a couple of days in the village, the old men asked me to come into the um, into a house and sit down and have a chat with them, and I thought, oh, what's going on here? And they they sat me down and they asked me very sincerely, Paul, you know the 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 planes that land at the airstrip. Men make those, right? And I said, yes, they're made in factories. And you forget that this is a community that's been thrust into the 21st century in the last 50, 60, 70 years. Mm. It, it's of seeing the country it, it resources being extracted around them. And you begin to wonder why, you know, who am I in the world now? If I used to, used to be able to be somebody, to be a big man, to be somebody of importance in my community by having a large garden and many pigs, and now... Who am I? I need to have a Hilux. I need to be able to fly places on aeroplanes, and I don't have that money. How do I get that money? How do I make something of myself? And when you become profoundly uncertain about who you are and what you are, these are symptoms, I think, of a greater problem going on. Tell me about Evelyn. Well, uh, yeah, I came across her one day. I was interviewing a series of, of government officials in, in Garoka, police, um, you know, people that ran the local penitentiary um, and other government workers, asking them, what can we do about this issue of sorcery violence? They want a police detective. This is a police detective from the homicide unit. He says... We claim to be Christians, but we are pretending because sorcery still exists. Although you may get was a Christian, you may have talked to us, or some of my still exist. He goes on to say that he believes in sorcery, and he has seen many cases of it. It's an evil thing deep within us, he says. They all kind of threw their hands up and said, oh, the problem's too big, it's inside our blood, we can't get rid of this now. And as I was leaving an interview, the wife of the um, superintendent of the penitentiary, she ran up to me and handed me a note in the back of the bus that I was climbing into and said, go and visit this woman. So I went to um, find Evelyn, and she's just an ordinary person. She she came from a small village in Shimbu, very closely involved with the Catholic Church, who's doing some good work up in Garoka to try and um, support the victims of sorcery violence. And what I saw in Evelyn that I was really impressed with is that she has no resources. She's built a, a shack in the shanties on the outside of Garoka, and she's rescuing the woman that somehow escaped these situations and looks after them, um, puts them in a safe house. Evelyn Kunda is talking about how she helps vulnerable women who have been accused of sorcery in their village. She puts them in a safe house, she hides them. She says they are traumatised. I'm fearful something. Is she in danger at all herself by protecting these? Of course, these? yeah. Um, there's no avoiding that. Uh, the community that she's living in, uh, you know, they see she lives uh, lives there by their grace and um, it's not won't take much for somebody to to say, well, here's this woman supporting these witches and it will come back on her. And in fact, she's had her house burnt down and been run out of, a, you know, a community and had to rebuild all over again in, in the last few years while I haven't been able to travel back to Papua New Guinea um, due to COVID. And I, part of my larger project in this film and the funds that we're growing for Evelyn is to try and get her into a, a better situation, a safer situation. So you've um, released a short film about this, but you're you're heading back there to do more filming for a, what a feature-sized film. Yeah, Wildfire very directly 
describes what's going on in the community from a number of different points of views. But yeah, we hope to continue the storytelling and to make some community resources that that might change people's thinking in the Highlands. You simply can't say to people, um, sorcery doesn't exist or it's not a real thing. You'll be seen as an outsider without any under- understanding. You've got to work with people there and and raise questions in their minds. You know, did that man die perhaps because of a heart attack or did he have TB at the time? That might have been the cause of his death rather than a witch killing. And so inserting those questions into people's mind um, seems to be the first step to making people pause before they move on to violent action. But Paul, if this is rife in the Highlands, why aren't these NGOs, you know, these aid organisations, even the churches? Because I know that there is a very strong presence of churches, not just the Catholic Church, in Papua New Guinea. So why are they not getting involved and trying to do something about it? Many people are trying, but lack of resources, it really comes down to. The government um, in 2015 agreed that something needed to be done about SAV, sorcery accusation related violence then, but then failed to put any funding into it. There are organisations like Oxfam, Save the Children and... um, and World Vision trying to make inroads in there. But, again, we're talking about huge numbers, and how do you change an entire culture's way of thinking and do it rapidly? It's it's a big challenge. And if you're thinking, this is just too far away and nothing to do with me, well, here's Paul's warning. Papua New Guinea is so important to New Zealand, and we don't really understand that here. We know so little about it. You know, it's it's the largest place in the Pacific, both population-wise, also its land mass is really large, and it lies at that intersection between Southeast Asia and in the Pacific. So it's going to be, it's both geographically, politically important, and if something goes bad, or goes even worse in Papua New Guinea, as it's likely to do in the next few years, people are starting to talk about it verging on a failed state. And if that happens, it could have a huge impact on New Zealand. Look at what's happened more recently in the Solomons, with their foreign policy has suddenly affected Australia and New Zealand's foreign policy massively. Their relationship with China has suddenly put it on the radar. The signing of a controversial security deal between China and the Solomon Islands is being labelled a major diplomatic failure and a turning point for the Pacific. Jacinda Ardern says there was simply no need for this agreement that they have signed. We are ready and available to meet the security needs of our neighbours. The same thing could very well happen in Papua New Guinea any day, given that China's been working very hard in Papua New Guinea over the last few years, building roads, airports, hospitals, and it won't take much for that for that flip over to happen. And then New Zealand and Australia will find themselves at this strange position where you've got small island nations relatively, I guess economically, uh, dictating foreign policy. That is really interesting, isn't it, that we know so little and we don't hear about much engagement by the government with Papua New Guinea. I should mention that uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade are very aware of these issues and they're working really hard on this stuff. But, yeah, why don't we hear so much about Papua New Guinea and New Zealand? I think there are some reasons for that. We're a Polynesian people. We uh, Most of the islanders are from Polynesia, some from Micronesia, not so much from Melanesia. Our only real contact with it is Fiji. So I'm, I'm hoping that by telling the story and, and bringing it to the wide, wider world, we can, we can put more action and effort and invest in Papua New Guinea. And if it were to verge over into a failed state and things were really to go south in Papua New Guinea, um, it would have a massive effect on well-being on everybody in the Pacific. We like to think of ourselves as New Zealanders as caring people, and we and we value our relationships with the Pacific. And to you know to see this going on over there and not do anything about it is extraordinary. The issue is at the moment, as I see it, that nobody knows what's happening up there. But is it also because it's it is so incredibly remote there? Large parts of it are still so poor, so not much information is getting out, as well as not much information is getting in. That's right. But, that, you know, that butts straight up against um, they have better cell services in some parts of Papua New Guinea than we do in, in uh, New Zealand. Is that um, right? And they've never had landlines. And suddenly people in the highlands have got 
cell phones, smartphones, that they're able to look up stuff. So if you go do a Google search for which, you don't have any of the, you know, our learned understanding of media practices and understanding of how how information is transferred. You and I can check a media source and go, well, that's not very reliable. And in fact, that's just somebody spouting off. Look at these, the things that are going on with around communication and belief systems in the U.S. It's not that far off. You suddenly got these people who have been cut off and remote. Now they've got these direct line on information that they're looking up and unable to qualify it, if you like. Are you worried about being at risk yourself going over there? Well, I haven't in the past, you know, mainly because I worked in the islands and I've had malaria more than six times and um, that's been the most dangerous aspect to it. In the highlands, people are quite astounded by me as an entity, I guess. I'm this blonde, blue-eyed creature that speaks like their grandfather because I learned uh, Tolpizan from the old men in my remote community in the rainforest. So, But also, you know, the ability to be able to read a situation and go, OK, I think it's time to step out of this. I must say, though, in my 20 years of coming and going, mostly people are fantastic. And that's what, you know, I'm struggling with personally is how do these wonderful people that no matter which village you wander into in the late afternoon, having walked over a, a range of mountains, people will say, come and stay with us. You know, we'll look after you. Do you need food? How do you match that against this sort of sudden you know, burst of mob violence that seems to take place? What is it about Papua New Guinea that makes you keep going back there? I guess, you know, in many ways I've been had that privileged opportunity to live with with remote communities and two years of learning language and musical practices and cultural practices. These have all become central to how I've um, made my career as an academic uh, and a filmmaker. Mm. So I, I feel I owe a debt of gratitude to the people there. And when I came across sorcery violence in the Highlands, I thought, how can I use these skills as a filmmaker, as a researcher, as somebody who has deep cultural knowledge with you know shared with me from these people how can I use them to help benefit Papua New Guinea? I don't want to be telling another story about how terrible Papua New Guinea is. This seems to be the only things that come out in the media. And yet it is such a rich place with incredible people. Well, good luck. And how long will you stay there? We'll try and spend a couple of months um, working with Evelyn and and trying to tell her story from that sort of grassroots perspective, look at the the woman that she's rescuing. But also, I guess, as I mentioned earlier, trying to understand those perpetrators. They're not evil people. They are people like you and I who who believe that they must take action, otherwise, uh, you know, more people in their community are going to die. The irony of that is that, of course, they are taking violent action to kill their own communities. That's it for today. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. The detail is public interest journalism funded through NZ On Air and produced by Newsroom for RNZ. You can get us downloaded free to your mobile device every weekday from any podcast platform. Today's episode was engineered by Jeremy Ansell and produced by Bonnie Harrison and Sarah Robson. And thanks to Paul Wolfram. Mā te wā.